Welcome back to our Lenten Path of Stewardship, where we are looking at and examining stewardship in the season of Lent. So here I am, I'm, I'm going to say it. We're going to talk about money today. Ah! Ee! I know, right? Nobody likes to talk about money. Nobody likes to talk about resources. But before we go any further, look back with me. Right? We're talking about stewardship. But what have we talked about up to this point? Everything but. We haven't even touched on the gift of our resources and the money God has given to us. We've talked about faith and abilities and relationships. And we've seen how all of those two are things that God can use. Now here's a thing for you to consider. Here's a question for you to think about. What is it that makes us so uneasy? What is it that makes us so uncomfortable whenever we start to talk about how we spend our money, what we spend our money on, how much we give, if we give, all of those sort of things? What is it that makes it that uncomfortable and that uneasy? I would say to you, and I'd point you to Luther's words. Luther talks about how manna, how money, is the most common idol in all of time, in all the world. Listen to what he says about this. He says, There are some who think that they have God in everything they need when they have money and property. They trust in them and boast in them so stubbornly and securely that they care for no one else. They too have a God, mammon, by name, that is, money and property on which they set their whole heart. This is the most common idol on earth. Those who have money and property feel secure, happy, and fearless, as if they were sitting in the midst of paradise. On the other hand, those who have nothing doubt and despair as if they knew of God, no God at all. We will find very few who are cheerful, who do not fret and complain, if they do not have mammon. This desire for wealth clings and sticks to our nature all the way to the grave. Talk about true words, right? This desire for wealth clings and sticks to our nature all the way to the grave. One of the reasons that I would put before you, one of the most difficult parts of this, is because all of us, our sinful nature desires more. It is so hard. It is so hard to really have open hands as we think about the stuff that we have earned, that we have spent time trying to capture, to gain more of. And so as we look at resources first, as we look at giving, as we look at having good stewardship of our money, we have to first acknowledge and confess that all of us, all of us have desired, all of us start and have greed in our hearts. And once we acknowledge that, then we can begin to ask the question, what do we do? How do we live this out? Paul talks a lot about giving in his second letter to the church in Corinth. And so I want to take you there today. He says some in chapter 8 and chapter 9. I'm, I'm going to read a decent amount here, but what I want you to hear is sort of the context here. So he's going to talk about an example of someone who has given in the past. He's going to talk about the church in Macedonia who actually was very poor but gave generously out of their means. And he's going to talk about this in a way to encourage the people in Corinth to do the same, to, to give out of their means. But then he's going to actually take a turn and, and say, hey, you know what though? I want you to be prepared that I'm going to ask for this so that then here's how I want you to give. Right? He's going to tell us the spirit, if you will, that we are to have when we give as well. So starting in chapter 8, I'm going to read a few verses and skip a sum and then pick up in chapter 9 again. Paul writes, Now we make known to you, brothers and sisters, the grace of God given to the churches of Macedonia, that during a severe ordeal of suffering, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of of their generosity. We could stop there. That is amazing. For I testify, they gave according to their means and beyond 
their means. They did so voluntarily, begging us with great earnestness for the blessing and the fellowship of helping the saints. And they did this, not just as we had hoped, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and to us by the will of God. What a beautiful picture, right? What a, an act of confession to, to say, man, I wish that I would have that mindset too, right? That so often it's a, well, how much do I have left? How much do I have after I've already spent the things that I have? These people are giving out of extreme poverty beyond their means. And they are begging Paul to be able to contribute. They're saying, hey, we know that you think we're poor. You, we know that you know we don't have a lot. But please let us contribute. Please let us take part in this wonderful thing that God is doing. Pray that God would create that in all of us. So, Titus urged that he had previously begun this work so that he should also complete this act of kindness in you. Keep going on here on a little bit, skipping down here to verse 12 or 10. So here's my opinion on this matter. It is to your advantage, since you have made a good start last year, both in your giving and your desire to give, to finish what you started, so that just as you wanted to do it eagerly, you can also complete it according to your means. He's talking to the church in Corinth now. For if the eagerness is present, the gift itself is acceptable according to whatever one has, not according to what he does not have. I do not say this, so there will be relief for others and suffering for you, but as a matter of equality, at the present time, your abundance will meet their need, so that one day their abundance may also meet your need, and thus there may be equality. For the eagerness is present, a gift is acceptable according to what everyone has, not according to what he does not have. This is that idea that you give out of what God has given to you. And you don't look at the person next to you. You don't look at the guy across the road or the woman across the street and say, I wish I could give that or I wish I had this much to give. It's that God has given you what you need to give and are able to give right now. You don't have to become retired. You don't have to wait until you have a million bucks. You don't have to wait until you have some sort of threshold. God has given you already the ability to give of your money, of your resources, as you are today. So, then he skips down here. He talks a little bit about Titus. I want to pick up in chapter 9 here. Therefore, I thought it necessary to urge these brothers to go to you in advance and arrange ahead of time the generous contribution you had promised. He's talking about the church in Corinth here again. So, this may be ready as a generous gift and not as something you feel forced to do. My point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give just as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that because you have enough of everything in every way at all times, you will overflow in every good work. There's just so much here, right? And this is tricky. I'll be really honest. As a, as a pastor, as a person who's concerned with your and my heart, there's a part of me that wants to tell you, you need to give. And that you should do it whether you want to or not. Because God has commanded you to do it. But then when I read these words of Paul, they strike me and, and I have to pull myself back. I have to say, well, that might be true. But what Paul says, also the word of God, says that you should give just as you've decided to. Right? Now, Paul says you should give as you've decided to. He doesn't say you can't or shouldn't. He says you should give, but you should not give under compulsion or reluctantly, but instead cheerfully. We could spend a lot more time on that. But I think the practical things, the things that I want you to think about, how do we live this out as we're living into the fact that God has made us stewards of his resources? I have three or four things I want to leave you. First, when you think about giving, do you think about it first 
or last. Here's what I mean by that. Do you set your budget at the start of the month with an allocated amount to giving already? Or do you wait until the end of the month and then suddenly there's nothing left and well, I just don't have anything to give? What would it look like for you to give first out of your budget? That's what we mean when we say first fruits. Maybe you could get off zero. There's certain sayings in certain communities that you just need to get off zero percent. So what would it look like for you if you're giving zero percent today to give one percent, to take one step forward? There's an analogy too of a ladder, right? So what would it look like for you to take one step up in your giving, one step higher in what you already give now? There's so many different ways that you could look into this. There's so many different ways that you could think about it. But as we start, as we look and we see the idol it is in our lives, as we confess that, and then as we look to scripture and we see the way in which Paul urges us to give cheerfully because God has given us what we need to give right now. It's already in your hands. You already have it according to your needs, not mine, not to the person next to you. How then does that enable us to do this? How then does that enable us to write a check, to give online, to put cash into the plate and say, God, yes, this is hard because it goes against my sinful nature because I want to keep everything to myself. But I know you've called me to do this and I'm glad to give you back what is yours. I'm glad to contribute to your work, to your ministry on earth that more people might come to know you. What does that look like for you? Let me pray for you. Let me bless you as you and I, as all of us walk together and tough tackle this really difficult but really important thing in our life as followers of Jesus. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we do give you thanks and praise for the many blessings, for the gifts of stewardship that you bestow on us and for the gifts of resources. Help us to steward them well. Help us to steward them faithfully, Lord. We know you ask for our all, but Lord, you know we know also that you ask us to give. So help us have generous hearts. Help us have cheerful, cheerful hearts as we give out of our need that you have already given and provided for us. So bless us, Lord. Challenge us, not just for our sake, but for your church's sake that more and more might come to know who you are and what you've done for them. Jesus, we pray this all in your perfect, your holy name. Amen. God be with you this week. Make sure you like and subscribe to this video. It, It helps people find it on the internet.